You're listening to Tech Nest, the Prop Tech Podcast. In each episode, you'll hear from Prop Tech founders, investors, and industry veterans on how they're using tech to change the way we buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Discover market opportunities, interesting data, growth tactics, and trends driving the industry forward. This isn't just another podcast about making money in real estate. This is about how we live. And now your host, Nate Smoyer. Hey, Rashik, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here, Nate. I'm excited to have you. Uh, We're going to talk all kinds of things of prop tech, transformation, digital trends in the industry, uh, you're, uh, right now in New York, even kind of chopping it up with some people and one of the most exciting segments of the real estate industry, HOAs. Yeah. I mean, it, it is an exciting time for a lot of things in real estate. I know that the, the market's quite interesting at the moment and people are fearful in the sense of where the economy is going as a whole, but, uh, real estate continues to thrive despite all obstacles. And, both condos and HOA members are looking um, to, to do what's necessary to get their buildings updated, and technology comes in the center of that. Yeah. Now, you're uh, you're currently the co-founder and COO of a company called Rewire. That's R-E-W-Y-R-E. And you guys are working with owners and operators on helping them find the right tech, implement the tech. Talk to me a little bit more about what that means in today's environment because companies know they have to have tech, right? So really to what degree are you bringing this to real estate that's kind of leading that transformation in those companies? Yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting. There is, um, you know, back in, I don't want to say back in the day, but currently right now, like if you need just general services or repairs, you have your local electrician or plumber, or HVAC, you know, person that you go to um, when it comes to maintenance or any other types of services. But when it comes to upgrading technology, uh, there's a lot of advancements that's happening at a at a pretty quick clip. And mm-hmm. to, as, a, as an owner operator of commercial real estate, it's very hard to keep track of what the latest and greatest or what is applicable for your building. And so what we've been focusing is trying to streamline that by bringing in the right technology providers onto our platform and and then getting them exposed to um, our clients, um, you know, so that they can be able to engage and get proposals um, for their technology needs. Gotcha. And so this is not, uh, hey, we need someone to make an invoice for us. This is not necessarily we need a graphic designer, right? These are a little bit more enterprise, custom tailored built solutions. Can can you break it down and give me an example of, and if you can say a client, great, but no need to press into things that you can't talk about, but can you give me yeah, an example so we can absolutely. tangibilize this? So we, we work, you know, one, one of our property management groups and they, they, they manage a portfolio of approximately about 70 or so, um, you know, commercial properties and it's a combination of both multifamily as well as office in the, in the New York city in the five, within the five boroughs of New York. And, and they come to us and they say, and they don't come to us to get on our platform. They say, okay, you know, this building, the, you know, we want to upgrade the camera solution to include night vision um, or to have the ability to, to have it where it's, you know, it's, it's flexible and, and not necessarily fixed cameras, but that you can, you know, manage it remotely. Um, they go on our platform, they request that quote, uh, say, this is what I need. Mm-hmm. You know, the various tech providers that are providing camera solutions will get those that request and be able to respond back with proposals. Um, you know, there's aspects in the sense of cameras, um, security systems, door access controls, and it goes as far as on energy efficiencies with building management systems, uh, solar panels, even EV charging. Uh, one thing that's also starting to come more in light is tenant experience apps to improve that experience mm-hmm. for tenants. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's, that's been another aspect um, in, in our platform as a whole. Now, you're not a stranger to leading innovation. I, you know, I, I dug up a little bit about you. You spent Uh-oh. quite some time at Mercedes, but specifically leading innovation yes. for yes. Mercedes Benz. You went on leading, uh, you know, as part of, and I'm not really sure all the details of Lab 1886, but you were you know, interim CEO there, and then even spent some time at Deloitte. 
why make the shift into prop tech? It sounds like you were already in like very well established industries with very reputable companies. Why take the chance go out and and start rewire to a, address the problems in in prop tech? Yeah, isn't that you know it, it's interesting you ask the question. I I do get that a lot, but isn't the aspect of being an innovator to push boundaries? And if I were to stay within um, automotive and mobility, it's it's not really. Um, pushing the envelope further um, personally without watching it. But from a logical perspective on why I switched over real estate, the fundamental commonality between the space of mobility um, and real estate is the fact that they both rely heavily on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um, It works a lot with public entities on smart infrastructure as a whole, both on on Mercedes-Benz Innovation in the sense of uh, different types of concepts as well as with Deloitte. and I think, you know, I saw the potential of disruption on the private side of real estate um, in the sense of realizing that future of a smarter city. And that's why I switched over to and developing Rewire, kind of the first step in making it easy for owners and operators to bring in technology to their buildings to get right. towards that realization of that vision. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, you know, maybe I'll ask you this one because now I'm curious your thoughts on this. You brought it up, the idea of mobility here. I, I've seen the. I don't know if Uber and Lyft get lumped into the real estate category, but I kept, I kept seeing like companies like Lime, like the scooter and bicycles, kind of get lumped into because they're part of city. Like you think about like city planning of like where. You know your little motorized scooters or bicycles, bike you know ride share can be in the city. So you, it's natural to think like city equals real estate, but scooters and bikes themselves aren't real estate. But they totally play into that. What what? Did, how do you see that fitting into prop tech ecosystem? Is it is it just on the outside? Is it somewhat part of it, like a small percent? How do you envision those two? You know those things coming together and what role they play together. Yeah, so mobility has an integral component in, in real estate. And if, if I can take that and dissect that question back for a moment in the sense of looking at what happened during the pandemic, um, I can then kind of turn around to saying, okay, well, how does mobility have a play? You know, mm-hmm. pre-pandemic, you know, people left their homes to go to offices um, and mm-hmm. then vice versa. And mobility was that kind of that the conduit between um, those two uh, spaces. And then you have this transition with during the pandemic where you needed goods to be delivered to you because you were confined within your, your home or, or condo. Um, what has happened is in the midst of this kind of paradigm shift in the sense of how we live and how we work and everyone trying to figure out what is that ideal world of a hybrid workspace, the concept of mobility being integrated as part of real estate is also shifting. So to your answer your question, you know, scooters originally was a kind of a uh, a nice to have additional source of commuting or maybe going around town. Um, but now mm-hmm. you see, you know, condos looking at bringing in scooters or even electric vehicles as part of an amenity to to provide you to get access to certain things because you're you're at home all the time. Right, and, and we're seeing that more and more, especially amongst luxury condos of these types of mobility amenities that are coming mm-hmm. to play. I'll tell you what, I did not guess that I would be talking about scooters this late. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I did not have that planned in my cards. That is not my notes. But I would tell you I, this: there, there are scooter companies that come to uh, commercial real estate events because they're like, people want to buy this and and use it, and it is becoming a true amenity. You, but you're not see the, the thing is you're not wrong about the infrastructure. So like in Chicago, they have oh, the zones are the t- it's the worst because you you go outside the bounds of like where the scooter can go, then you can't park the scooter. That is correct. Yeah, that creates a challenge because I don't really know where all the bounds are, and I don't live there anymore. And the last time I was there visiting for OB, I was there for company business. And I was like, well, I'll just take a scooter because that'll be cheaper than a cab. And, you know, we're a Midwestern startup, so we're we're frugal. And it was one of those, like, Chicago, like, swampy humidity days. So the scooter wasn't going fast to cool me down. 
And then I was already regretting that. And then I had to park it still another mile from the office. <laughs> and it was like, this is not cool. I got a backpack on, you know, it was, it was, it was one of those things, but you're, you're right. If it, if it was kind of plugged into the building or if, you know, they obviously the city designs the zone. So if the city is up to speed on it, but lots of pieces there, I don't go down that, that rabbit hole too far, but I, I want to I jump back a little bit here. I want to talk a little bit more about the needs that you're seeing in the industry right now. Um, I've seen some chatter on Twitter saying like prop and I think there's been a few articles of like prop tech isn't growing the way we thought it would, because maybe right now owners are saying like, it's not as necessary as we thought we we've been too bullish on prop tech companies being able to scale and really fundamentally change commercial real estate, especially are you, are you seeing whispers of that as well? Or are you seeing like, no, prop tech really is innovating and helping transform traditional real estate companies yeah you know I, i've been hearing that um fairly often um, and that's even you know irrespective of the current market situation prop tech is still quite important um you got three categories of, of innovation or disruption into this industry you got the nice to have the want to have and the money mm-hmm. and when you get those three buckets um, what is happening is a lot of the nice to haves are slowly starting to shift to want and must um, as demand comes into play, depending on use cases, but mm-hmm. also with respect to regulations that are pushing. So what we saw, you know, you know, um, probably within the few years after the start of the pandemic, a lot of the nice to haves became wants to must, and that was around access control. I want to be mm. able to know who's coming into the building, for how long, where are they or where they're going to be, for more from an aspect of maintaining spacing of and an amount of density of, of humans um, in, an, in a certain environment. So mm-hmm. that was one aspect of it, and that kind of caused this shift of more on remote door access management. So that's still a want to have, and that's a pretty you know good part of our business. The mm-hmm. nice to have has been more on the tenant experience app side where the tenant experience has become a part of a more of a, 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 an, a common, um, an amenity, so to speak, to, to improve that experience, to get people into the office. Um, mm-hmm. And that's been on the nice side. But the must-have has been focusing heavily around energy efficiency. Um, mm. There's been um, various cities across the U.S. that's been pushing various regulations to not only mandate certain levels of carbon you know, carbon requirement, but even implying penalties. So in, in New York, for example, there's, you know, there's the law of the law 97 that everyone's mm-hmm. talking about as massive penalties by not being compliant with anything. And they've got, what, a year and a half to get that done? Yeah, so there, you know, the law is, it, it, in the framework perspective, is finalized, but there's still a lot of questions about in the sense of, well, how is, are there exceptions to, you know, Section 8 housing or uh, buildings of certain ages or sizes? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, technically, as of now, it will go into effect in 2024. Um, but we're seeing a lot of inquiries of, like, how far am I? What do I need to, to get to that? And this is where it's interesting where people are we are and think, you know, as simple as just a software optimization play into my HVAC system, or is it something more than that? Right. There's, I mean, as far as my my understanding, I'd love to hear your take on this. But there's there's kind of a few layers. I mean, like the first bit to meeting any of these requirements is like based on what measurement, right? So we have to figure out what we're even putting the baseline of. I mean, if it's carbon emissions, fine. But like, okay, then you have to measure that somehow. Is there like a a formula based on the building size? Is it the energy usage? And then how is that even measured? How is that visualized? And then what do you do to even adjust that? Yeah, and that's that's the interesting part, Nate. So when you when you break it down, um, the way they're measuring is by electricity usage and mm-hmm. natural gas. Usage, right? uh, there are some challenges to that because the building owner, say you you have a ten floor office building with ten tenants. Um, you, can, you can provide the overall gas and electric usage, but you really don't have any control over what your tenants do, or let right. alone they're required by law to give you what their electricity and gas bill is. 
So that has not necessarily been defined of like, well, how do you get penalized when you don't have control of 80% of your building and mm-hmm. their utilization if they're leaving their lights on 24 hours a day, which will penalize you. And the second component is like, say you want to be green and you put a bunch of EV charges. Well, that's a lot of electricity usage. There's no way of differentiating for them. And then you get penalized in electric vehicles. So there's a lot of things that still needs to be figured out. And, and that's where, you know, when they do figure it out, we'll be there to give the right technology to support okay, it. Okay. In all seriousness. Uh, so let, let <laughs> No, it's this, funny, right? It's, 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 it's kind a of lot funny, of things right? that people haven't really, figured out yet. It could be the thing, right? If you had a whole bunch of Tesla chargers because that was the condo building like appeal, right? And and, and so let, we have all these EV charging stations. And that's the thing that puts you over to be in fun. Like, do you, do you retrofit things in the building or do you just remove the EV chargers at I, that I point? Think, I think it's going to be a little bit of a trial and, uh, you know, And eventually the city will come around and realize that there must be ways to, to file exemptions uh, for that utilization. So um, it's just going to be, it'll be a little bit painful first in 2024. So um, I'd love to hear more about, you, you talked about like, there's the nice to have, the, what, what was it? What was the three? The nice to have, the want to have, and the must have. What yeah. is Rewire doing to help real estate companies navigate th- that triple fork in the road, if you will. Like, how do they know yeah. which one is which and, and where to go from there? You know, it was, it was interesting about that, Nate, is we've been involved in a lot of, we've basically been in the middle of a lot of those conversations. And mm-hmm. the reality is, is that we're just another cook in the kitchen. And so we recently did a pivot where we just completely take a step out and allow the owners or operators to engage directly with the tech companies um, mm-hmm. because, I mean, they're the experts. Um, on top of that, we've brought in consultants and engineers onto our platform where they can engage with them directly as well um, in order to make sound decisions because what we've realized, there's not a one-size-fits-all, and mm-hmm. every building is different with respect to what they would like to have and what they must, um, you know, get installed. So. It, you know, and it goes back to one of your earlier questions of like, is pop tech, you know, slowing down or is it potentially dying? It's not. It's just in a phase of, of, it's where buildings and building owners are trying to realize where do they fit in that space, and that's mm-hmm. all part of like what happens with any form of digital transformation. It's just kind of like exploration and and um, epiphany moment, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I would tend to agree. Now, there's there is certainly no shortage of talk of. I mean, we talk about local law, law ninety seven, but ESG is a, generally there's no shortage of talking points and headlines. I mean, it's it's in co- constant constantly being brought up in different things outside of New York City. What are you seeing in trends from real estate companies of things that they're actively looking into to to meet or to promote their ESG? projects or regulations yeah so um in general there are a couple of you know standards that are out there you know wired score which is well which is the, the lead standards have been around for a long time mm-hmm. so from a standardization perspective those are kind of three potential metrics in determining where buildings are and and in for those are ways that they're you know, leveraging to kind of determine how they want their buildings to be. And that's because there is a desire among tenants to be in a in an efficient building. For buildings that do already exist, um, I would say it's across the U.S., unless it's regulatory regulatorily mandated, mm-hmm. um, it's still more of an exploration phase. I mean, you have some of the big REITs out there that are meeting ESG mandates, and then pushing down energy efficiency solutions via strategic partnerships. I mean, one example is like the data. You know, they, they have a lot of large scale relationships and they're, they're, they're rolling out their software solutions to monitor and then determine what are potential energy efficiency solutions to implement. Um, and they're also a channel partner on Rewire too, but I think it's still in an exploration phase. I don't think there's any definite direction where it's going just yet. Yeah. Yeah. 
So then not to, to cut that one short, but I do want to, uh, the other hot topic that possibly has totally overshadowed ESG in the last few months is AI. What's happening with AI in commercial real estate, anything meaningful and hopefully outside of just, you know, listing descriptions. Yeah. Just give me a second here. Let me just ask Pat CPC to answer that question for you. Um, <laughs> What is going on in the world of commercial real estate with AI? I'd like to know that you already had that tab pulled up, ready to go. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding here. Um, first of all, I'm glad that ChatGPT has brought awareness to the mass population of AI. I mean, AI has been around for a while, and there's been a lot of development in that space. But I'm just glad that it's 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 becoming more of a center, you know, a dinner table conversation because there are a lot of components to talk about in the sense of ethics and trust and reliability of what AI can provide you and and whether it's mm-hmm. the only source to consider. But AI can have a valuable component into figuring out how to make our buildings more efficient faster in current forms of you know, on an economic system. And also, I mean, when you look at tenant experience, I mean, why not have some sort of test GPT to be able to, or kind of like an open AI system that, um, where you can ask questions and, and improve the experience of your building as a result. So mm-hmm. um, I think it's going to accelerate PropTech even further once you see that being implemented in a lot of the solutions that are out there. So, so we can put a pin in it. I, I did go to chat GPT to ask, what is How is commercial real estate adopting AI technology? And this is according to uh, I th- I'm still in Chat GPT three, so don't hate me. Okay, okay, okay. So that, I'll let you go on that one. We're ma- we're working with 2019 data. I think I think that's a disclaimer okay. here. 2021. I don't know. Um, I'll read off the bullet points: predictive analysis, smart building management, virtual tours, augmented reality. Uh, I'm going to doubt that one. Chatbots and virtual assistants, property management. It's pretty vague. Is being used to streamline property management tasks such as rent collection, maintenance, and repairs. That's not AI. Well, uh, I think, I think that, though that you know, energy efficiency and tenant experience and improving on that are the two things that I pull out of that. Yeah, well, that was my, the next next six is tenant experience was one of them. Energy management was the next one. Lease lease analysis. That's true. Market research, building maintenance, security. Oh, and risk yeah. assessment. Assessment. So. Some of these on here, I I actually believe the um the way they describe the property management piece. I'm, I'm eh, eh, yeah, okay. I mean there there is we'll see we'll see where that goes. It's just but code. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think at the end of the day, it is you know it it it, it is categorized around those three umbrella buckets: it's security, mm-hmm. experience, and energy efficiency, and those are the where the, the biggest opportunities are in improvement what, with AI implementation. So, um, so yeah. I think with 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 that component of ChatGPT, I'm okay with. There we go. Okay, so we got we got a pretty decent answer here. We got in the in the actual field, and then we got what the AI bot believes is actually happening. Um, I saw that Zillow and and Redfin they have, I mean they're jumping on it. They've gone out there and announced they've got some uh, new Chat GPT apps, which I, I think it's important to distinguish. There's there's Chat GPT plugins that you can be building, and then other people have their own homegrown. AIs, and then you have some that are like using AI in the background, and then you have AI that, let's be honest, it's it's just a if a whole bunch of if and statements. It's not it's not AI. It, it's marketing talk. Uh, but are there any companies that you're seeing because you, you guys work with a bunch of channel partners? Any companies that you're working with or seeing that are doing some really unique things with AI and bringing that to commercial real estate? Yeah, we've had conversations, and and they're kind of giving us like off the record that they're working on things, but nothing that has been formally announced yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say the next six months are going to be very interesting in the world of prop tech, um, especially uh, around AI implementation. That's additional feature enhancements, and and that also will help um, make it easier for um, owners and operators to consider implementation. Although I do have one question here. You know, Shoot. we've been talking about a lot of, you know, technology implementation, um, but the human interaction is still a critical component in any type of building environment. And, you know, the doorman, 
at a at a multifamily um, condo or at an mm. office. You know, just because we have all these features that are coming with experience, security, security, and so forth, um, those are jobs that I think will still stay because it, it's that's that's a human experience that you're not going to get through an app. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's important to bring up the conversation, like this is not eliminating jobs. This is, if anything, it's enhancing those jobs to focus on that personal interaction. Mm. I think that's a valid point. I mean, you know, people walking, coming and going into a building. Yeah. The person who works the, or the people who work the front desk will learn who the regulars are, but there's also some element of like, this is where access control becomes more important. You know, they have the ability to verify based on either key card or fob or other ways of knowing who's coming and going. But when you live in a building and you get this, and this was my experience in Chicago, you, you get to know the people at the front door and you appreciate the fact that like they really are the gatekeeper of like, Hey, who comes and goes in the building? Cause you want to feel safe and secure at home. And those people, they, they provide a, a very powerful, uh, or, or very valuable, uh, service to everyone who lives in that building. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's that it's a piece of it's I think it's the peace of mind knowing that someone's there for you. And that's something that an app can't uh, ever replace. Yeah. I think that's a valid point. Uh I mean, we say it in the intro of the show, this is not just about it's not a show just about making money in real estate. This is about how we live. Yep. And that was something I came to the conclusion of uh during during lockdowns in the, in the midst of the pandemic, which was we were all forced to confront whether we wanted to or not. Is this how I want to live? And it wasn't just the pandemic situation. It was actually all of us were having to look at inside of our homes. Did we like inside of our homes? Did we like the city that we were in or the location? And a lot of us threw out the rule books uh, and totally changed it. Um, some, you know, there was a deluge of people who ran to Florida for multiple reasons. I went to South Dakota so, <laughs> and well, but, it, it, I kind of hunker down in San Francisco, and uh, you know, but I, I, I hear your point, Nate. I mean, like there there has been a lot of movement and shift, and in, in, in a lot of it in the sense of reflection of of where are you living, mm-hmm. um, are you happy in your space? But I can assure you that prop tech, you know, at that point was not part of the consideration of that conversation in no, your mind. No. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So, so the, the, the types of real estate companies that really need to be going and you know, checking out rewire, but also even like having these kinds of discussions internally, if we were to build a persona of them, of like assets under management or size of with number of employees or buildings, like what's the range of company that really stands to benefit from going full on into digital transformation or even dipping their toes into adopting more prop tech as part of their business stack yeah um in in answering that question uh, i'll I'll give you an example um you've got the large reefs out there they have Mm -hmm. massive teams that do research every day to find the latest technologies and they have the 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 number of portfolios to have leverage in negotiating strategic content with a lot of tech companies um those relationships are pretty much set if not set already i mean there are Mm -hmm. only a certain number of large reefs out there if we do not address providing the similar capabilities to mid to small size owners and operators, you're going to start seeing a disparity in inequity in the sense of buildings that are transformed and buildings that are outdated. And by having that inequity, you're underlying another level of inequity in the sense of, like, for example, penalties with Local 187, where the big organizations get all these credits and benefits and the little mom and pops of small you know, portfolio managers that you know put their life mm-hmm. savings into having three, four, five properties are going to get the brunt of those penalties. So our purpose in Rewire is enabling the small to mid-sized owners and operators to have a similar capability of finding the right technologies so that inequity gap is reduced before it gets too large. I love that. Uh, that makes so much sense to me to, to be doing that. And Obviously, you know, that, like you said, like at the REITs, those relationships are established. They know who they're going with. They may be even be LPs in different funds that have invested in different prop techs, which I see exactly. pretty yeah. frequently, which is hey, on their part, very smart, obviously, right? Work with the companies that you, to some degree, have an investment in. But for everyone else, 
that maybe isn't invited to that party, how do you pick? That can be a pretty big decision. And even knowing if you should be picking uh, can be a pretty significant decision. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you know, right now those large REITs are using this as a differentiator with respect to having those, you know, technologies on their portfolios. Mm -hmm. Um, but the reality is, is, um, you know, smaller, smaller scale owners and operators don't necessarily have those types of resources. Even, and they, and they don't, and they just go with what they have or what they know. And, you know, it's an opportunity for the larger REITs to step up also and to support the rest of the fragmented industry and say, okay, in order for us to really be sustainable and in order for us to really be part of this transformation is to share those resources. I mean, there's no harm in, in saying, hey, these are the right people to work with. Let's open up our portfolios um, of, of these great players and let everyone to benefit from it. So, But, you know, in, until then, that's where Rewire will step in and, and provide that kind of leverage for, um, you know, small and mid-sized. Yeah, very cool. All right, last thing I want to get into about uh, what you're seeing in the industry and, and, and how Rewire is helping with this, and then we'll get jump into the bottom of the show. But I want to talk a little bit about data. You kind of mentioned data. You know, I think there was this th- I don't know the, how, what the time period was, but for a while there was a theme. Right? You know, it was own your own data. That was, the, And it wasn't just prop tech specifically. And I, I learned this from a software company I worked at starting in, tw- in uh, 2011. And it was something that our CEO would just constantly talk about is why we we built all our in-house tools we wanted to own all of our own data we wanted to own our own our own stack there's some advantages to that of course long term but like in the near term that can be very slow going and tough to keep pace what is what are real estate companies saying right now what are they talking about when it comes to owning their own data structuring their data even having access to analyze their data what are they looking for that is really moving the needle for companies today? Yeah, I think the whole concept of owning your own data, that seems to be pretty mainstream right now. But the reality is that 99% of data is garbage. It's really about that 1% of data and the analytics of finding that 1% is that what you need. So I would say it's not about owning your own data. What real estate, the real estate industry needs to go for is own your own analytics. Mm. Um, and that is the critical component is because by owning your analytics, that is what's valuable. And where you've seen some of the, you know, the companies out there, like for example, Cherry, uh, which mm-hmm. has done a lot of analytics and insights and providing that. They're not giving raw data, they're giving the analytics and that's the value. Um, but, you know, there is an opportunity for real estate owners to also own that analytics on, on, their properties and that can give them leverage in determining what they need to do in, in transforming the building. So that's what I would say is that's the mindset that needs to change. Like, you know, everyone used to say in the last decade, data is the new oil, right? Analytics is the new engine. That's what I would say. Got it. I like that that little bit there. Um, and of course, obviously, uh, we had Kevin Stoffman from Cherry. Uh, uh, on... Kevin, good old buddy. Do you know I used to work with him? Back no. This? Yeah, Ke- Kevin and I, we, you know, he, he's one of those guys that inspired me to get into real estate. You know, we he knows worked everyone. On, I mean, who does Kevin not know? I'd be surprised if he know. doesn't know everybody in the White House, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go? Guy. We can go, we can go back and edit the original question when I ask you why'd you get into prop tech. You can just say Kevin. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, just be like, why prop tech, Kevin Stockman? <laughs> Mike Drop. Well, for, for everyone who hasn't listened to that episode, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, you can go to iTunes or technos.io to find that episode. It's a solid one. Well, we're going to jump into my favorite segment of the show. This is called For the Future. For the Future is when I get to ask each guest who comes in the show to give their best predictions based on the following four questions. Rashik, are you ready to play? I'm ready to play. All right, let's do it. First one here, what does Rewire look like one year from now? Um, Rewire will be nationally recognized and um and every it's a good question but i would say my vision is is that it's basically nationally recognized and utilized by all small to mid-sized owners and operators let's go number two how will ai change the way real estate companies operate in the next few years i would say ai makes it a lot easier to be efficient um, with building management 
Number three on For the Future, what's one industry trend you think will continue but you wish would go away? Ooh, I would say uh, one industry trend that will continue is social media um, and that's continued growth of social media, and I wish that would go away because it does nothing but harm for everybody. Whoa. Do you want to expand on that any at all? Yeah, I think, um, and this sort of kind of goes back maybe to the, the question about AI and, and the trust and ethics, but I mean, we've seen a lot of investigation on TikTok and other types of algorithms of other social media platforms. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, unless there are better ways of controlling that, it would lead us towards a more dangerous path of misinformation and, you know, basically molding younger generation's mind into the future. Um, and I think that, that, that's a dangerous concept that I think, you know, it doesn't matter what technology you put in every industry, I think social media mm-hmm. is, if not managed responsibly, can kind of deteriorate all that. Gotcha. Last one on For the Future, what's one thing you believe will dramatically change or fade away in real estate as a result of tech advances? I think what will change dramatically is how we use our space when it comes to work, play, and play. Technology will transform the physical and the digital aspects mm-hmm. um, of real estate. And, you know, as I've spoken with some leading architects and visionaries in that space, it's going to be very interesting to see how that dramatically transforms in the next, you know, six to seven years. All right. All right, we've got three more questions for you. These are so listeners get to know you just a bit better. First one, what are you reading? Uh, Nothing right now. That's okay. and the reason why I'm not reading right now is I have three little kids at home that takes up a lot of my time. And if anything, um, I'm reading up a lot in general of taking care of them, you know, a little bit here and there. I mean, it's kind of a big responsibility, and they don't give you a manual from day one, right? That's so no, I've been told. There's not, <laughs> but you know, they're, they're three little gems. I love them. Um, and actually, if you want to answer the question of what I'm reading, I'm reading a lot of kids' books every night. So, a lot of have lot you of memorized any of them yet? I've memorized a lot of them, and I'm not going to recite them now. So, <laughs> a lot of life lessons in them. I will tell you that. There you go. Very cool. All right, number two. Who are you learning from? I'm learning a lot from my wife. Uh, she is smart, resilient, uh, calm, collected, and she has been an anchor for me. Um, and I think uh, without her by my side, I don't know if I could be successful in my career right now. That's amazing. Last one here. What inspires you? I think um, not to go back to my children, um, but what inspires me is the potential of our future generation and what they can make of this planet. And and that inspiration enables me to push the envelope on leaving at least a foundation of something that they can work with um, to getting the planet to where it should be. And um, that is a life mission of mine um, to kind of lay that out, not only for my kids, but for every one of our kids. That's very cool. Rashik, this has been awesome. Thank you for coming on the show. And also, you know, no one knows this, but we had like a ton of scheduling conflicts to make this happen. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, I always really honored to have guests like you on the show. For people who want to connect with you and or go learn more about Rewire, where do they go and how do they do that? I mean, the easiest way to to connect with me is on LinkedIn. Um, You just got to search for Rashik. It's R-A-S-H-E-Q. Um, it's easy to find me. And then for Rewire, it's www.rewire.com. That's R-E-W-Y-R-E. Yep. And I'll have a link to Rashik's profile on technest.io. So if you want to just jump over to there, check out the episode, and you can catch his LinkedIn profile there. It's been great. Thank you for coming on the show. I hope to see you around sometime. Nate, thank you. It's been an honor. Thanks for listening to TechNest. 
the Prop Tech Podcast. Find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode on technest.io. You can get future episodes delivered to your ears directly by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast apps. Follow TechNest on social media to stay up to speed on new developments, resources, and announcements in PropTech. Your support is greatly appreciated. There's two ways you can directly support this podcast. Share episodes you find interesting, and then leave a review of the show in the App Store. From Nate and the TechNest team, thanks for listening.